All right, welcome everyone to the Central Texas Marijuana Policy Candidate Forum. Um, we are awesome um, to have all of these amazing panelists on with us today, right before the vice presidential debate that's gonna be coming on after this. Um, so make sure that you get all of your political things in today at once if you want. Um, but you know, with marijuana policy being such a hot topic, um, both locally in the city here in Austin and around the state and nationally, it's extremely important that we know exactly how the candidates stand on the issue. And if they're supportive, you know, what kind of policies do they plan on championing? How do they plan to represent us up at the Capitol? So we've reached out to all of the Central Texas candidates, both Republican, Democrat, and Libertarian, and invited them to join us tonight. And we do have nine distinguished speakers here with us. And what we're gonna do is first, we're going to take the Texas House of Representative candidates, then we'll go into the US Congressional District candidates, and then we'll end with the US Senatorial uh, candidate that's joining us today. So as we go, um, if you have any questions, you can drop it in the Q&A a box down below or in the comments down below and we will get to those after everyone's statement so there'll be a little lightning round of q a and then uh, we'll close it out talking about some upcoming events and important voting information as you guys know there's been a lot of things having to do with election dates in the news and so it's extremely important that we're all up to date on how we can be registered to vote where do we vote well register to vote deadline passed on the fifth but um, where can we go vote and when those um, early voting dates are. So let us first start and welcome Vicki Goodwin. I am gonna bring her up onto the stage. If you'll unmute yourself. And Hi. Vicki is an incumbent with the Democratic Party and she serves as a state representative for House District 47. And thankfully you have come to so many of our candidate forums. We really appreciate your support. Um, so can you tell a little bit to our audience, both here on Zoom and on Facebook, you know, tell us a little bit about cannabis policy and what it means for you. Absolutely. Well, good evening and thank you. I'm Vicki Goodwin. I'm serving my first term in the Texas legislature, and I appreciate you hosting this forum tonight to allow listeners to hear my positions on marijuana. I want to start with my voting record. During session, I voted for three bills that are relevant here. First, I voted for the expansion of medical marijuana. That expansion could have gone further, so there's more work to do. Texans with cancer, chronic pain, or PTSD should have access to a full spectrum of medical cannabis with their physicians making dosing decisions. Also, next session, we need to make it easier for doctors to prescribe. Right now, they have to spend thousands of dollars to get on the Compassionate Use Registry. Second, I voted for the legalization of hemp, which also makes CBD oil legal. And there are so many combinations of oils that can help with a variety of ailments. And third, I voted for the decriminalization of small amounts of marijuana. That bill passed the House, but Lieutenant Governor wouldn't hear the bill in the Senate. So it died after a lot of work by Representative Moody and many others. We should continue to work to change the law so that the possession of less than one ounce of marijuana does not result in jail time or a criminal record. Like most people, I understand that recreational marijuana is not different than enjoying alcohol to relax and unwind. Marijuana can be abused just like alcohol can be abused. I believe in individuals taking responsibility and allowing adults 21 and older to possess limited amounts of marijuana and establishing a system in which marijuana is regulated and taxed similar, similarly to alcohol. I was very impressed with the information presented by Texans for Responsible Marijuana Policy during the recent candidate briefing. From the cannabis primer to the extensive information on federal and state policies and desired changes, the information makes my job easier. So it's greatly appreciated. Now to tell you a little bit about myself and my goals. I'm a mom, a wife, a small business owner and a public servant. My oldest son just graduated from medical school. So we've had conversations about medical marijuana. He agrees that it needs to become easier to do clinical trials to understand all the ways that marijuana might be used to treat patients. 
I have several friends with MS, and I think all of them have tried some form of marijuana as an aid in their pain management. Some are more adamant in their support of marijuana, but they all believe, as I do, that we should do more research and use this plant that is so abundant and relatively easy to grow. My mom died of cancer in 2014, and I can recall how severe her pain became and the negative side effects of all the pain medication she was taking. Maybe some form of marijuana could have helped her, but because we aren't doing research on it, we just don't know, and that should change. There's also an opportunity with expanding medicinal marijuana or legalizing recreational marijuana. No one ever wants to hear about taxes, but as with cigarettes or alcohol, the sale of marijuana could generate some tax revenue. Additionally, it could cut down on the illegal drug trade. I don't wanna make it sound like this will fix all our problems because I think that's unrealistic. I've watched documentaries about how things are going in other states where marijuana is legal and there's still some issues to overcome. Nevertheless, there are opportunities and advantages to decriminalizing marijuana and making it legal for recreational purposes. I look forward to continuing to work with you all on these issues. However, first I have to win re-election to the Texas House. I'm in a tight race with Justin Berry, who's an Austin police officer. While I won my election against a Republican in 2018, that doesn't guarantee a win this time around. I've been working with a number of groups who share my values to make phone calls to voters in my district. I'm aligned with teachers and public school advocates in my support for public education and ensuring all kids get the best education possible. I'm also endorsed by the Climate Cabinet because I know how critical it is to address the issue of climate change while there's still time. A couple of other really important issues we'll be working on next session are redistricting and access to affordable health care. So we're going to have a full agenda during what is like to, likely to be a very unusual session in 2021. And I will be right there with you in support of expanding the legalization of marijuana. Thanks for your time. Awesome, thank you so much for such a well thought out statement. You really touched on so many of the issues that are important to us, so that, that's very good. And next I want to welcome Representative Erin Zweiner. She's an incumbent with the Democratic Party as well, and she represents the Texans in House District 45. And so now let's welcome Representative Zweiner. Hey y'all, uh, I'm Erin Zweiner. I represent House District 45, Hayes and Blanco counties just southwest of Austin. Uh, and I'm not sure what we're supposed to talk about after you, Rep Goodwin. Um, that was such a great illustration of why Rep Goodwin is my favorite of my fellow freshman members because she's always one of the most prepared people on the floor and does the work. Um, but you know, I, I kind of want to acknowledge the political landscape that we are in. A majority of Texans support full legalization of marijuana. Unfortunately, our elected officials are a fair bit behind and are taking some time to catch up. And I really wanna thank y'all for doing the work to help push candidates and office holders forward on this issue. Um, because you know, it's an issue that gets talked a lot about you know, in, in this recreational space without acknowledging the very real cost to our community that criminalizing marijuana has and the very real economic benefits of legalizing cannabis. Um, so I, I wholeheartedly support the legalization of cannabis. I think, so, I think it's what makes sense. Uh, I think evidence shows us it will reduce violent crime to have, this, uh, to have the cannabis market be a legal above ground one. Um, and I think the dollars and cents add up as well. And of course, all of this is rooted in the fact that there is not a good societal uh, reason to have cannabis be illegal in the first place. It doesn't make sense. It never really did. Um, and it's time for us to address that. So I just kind of want to talk about a few of the things I'm thinking about as I think about marijuana policy. One thing is that we spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year just to enforce um, low level marijuana possession crimes by some estimates around $750 million. I can think of a lot of things I would rather we spend $750 million, um, healthcare and schools to name two. Uh, and that's a lot of our local tax dollars as well. Um, that's a lot of money that's coming out of people's property tax bills. That's something where, where we can reduce cost. And it also means that our law enforcement officers are spending time on these crimes that are victimless crimes that don't hurt anyone instead of 
investigating potentially more serious crimes. So I wanna make sure we're using our law enforcement officers time well. And then I think we also have to talk about the racial disparities in marijuana enforcement and really understand the way, um, the way possession of any drug really, but marijuana in particular, disproportionately Im impacts our black and brown communities. Um, white people and black people use cannabis at the same rate. Black people are nearly four times as likely to be arrested. That, that's a disparity that is a problem. Um, and it's a problem that we have left this tool out there to be used in this racialized way in our communities. Um, if we legalize marijuana, some estimates are that Texas can bring in almost a billion dollars of revenue annually. We have seen states like Washington and Colorado bring in hundreds of millions of dollars. I can guarantee you a lot of that Colorado money is coming from Texans. Uh, Texans already love to vacation in Colorado and uh, Colorado gave them another reason to visit. You know, I, I would like our dollars to stay here in Texas. I would like us to acknowledge the realities on the ground uh, and change the situation. And then I also wanna to touch a little bit on medical marijuana. I did file one piece of legislation related to medical marijuana last session. Um, I intend to file it again and move forward with it. Um, uh, it was legislation to end this practice of pain management doctors penalizing their patients if they test positive for marijuana. So we have a lot of pain patients who explore other options and, and we know the effects of opiates can be devastating uh, on an individual and their family. And so sometimes patients look for other options. They shouldn't be afraid to look for other options because of worry that they will lose any access to pain medication, especially now when just crossing a state line means folks can be um, accessing cannabis without, any, without breaking any laws in that state. So that's something I'm gonna pursue again next session. I'm really glad that we passed legislation last session to expand access to medical marijuana. I agree with Rep Goodwin, it did not go far enough. Uh, we need to regulate cannabis like any other drug and the doctors or um, other medical providers should decide what it's appropriate to prescribe it instead of the state of Texas trying to give arbitrarily narrow situations in which those prescriptions are acceptable. So I'm glad we passed the legislation. It, it made a big difference for a lot of Texas families and a lot of folks who are struggling, but it didn't go anywhere near far enough. And I look forward to picking up that work next session, as well as picking up the work to decriminalize. Those are both important steps uh, on the way to full legalization. Um, and I can promise you we're going to keep chipping away until we get there. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. And you know, T talking about racial disparity, I just wanted to comment on that real quick. There was actually a um, research study that was just published on PubMed having to do with the Harris County Diversion Program, which has saved Harris County a lot of money. But what they're discovering is that they are still arresting now almost 80% um, people of color. And so there is still this disparity inside of the system that has to be addressed. And that's not, you know, diversion pro programs are very helpful, but how we're going to really stop um, criminalizing people is by changing the law. So I just wanted to riff off that. <laughs> and then uh, next we are going to have Representative John Boosie III. He's actually my representative. Uh, previously, there was a prohibitionist in his spot and he came on as a freshman last time around. And he might speak a little bit about one of his bills that he authored, but he also did um, a bill regarding testing like the previous representative. So now I'm going to Bring it over to Representative Boosie. Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Hi, Hi. I found you. <laughs> There's so many of you. <laughs> thanks Thanks for having me. Um, I, I'm excited to be here. I, I'm a freshman state rep along with Rep Zwiener and Goodwin. We came in together. I uh, My priorities have stayed very much focused on the fight for voting rights and working on the elections committee, also the fight for Medicaid expansion and what that would do for for uh, every Texan, um, but but to be here today and get to talk to y'all is is a is a great opportunity. I appreciate it. I agree with what Rep. Zwinger was just talking about. We need to legalize, regulate, and tax marijuana. We we've got to decriminalize. I was proud to help support legislation last time um, to expand some use to help in the House pass bills that would have helped with decriminalization. But we've got a big fight on our hands and we need to keep amplifying it. We need elected officials that will continue to amplify it. Um, last week, I did a ledge chat. I've been doing a bunch of these uh, where I was joined by Speaker Joe Moody and we spent some time talking about 
the legislation he had and where it got and where we can keep going. But I think one thing we have to do is continue to, you know, really make it okay to be public and, and support and understand why this needs to get done in Texas, why it benefits us economically, um, why it benefits our health. I, I think about the VFW hall in our district in Leander. I spent a lot of time up there. And one of the regular conversations we have is about the struggles with PTSD and the need for medical cannabis. And so I, I just think it's a day-to-day uh, occurrence where it comes up where this would benefit our state and the people of our state in one way or the other. So we've, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, I, I'm, it's not going to happen overnight, not with the makeup of the Senate, the Lieutenant Governor, the Governor, but I think we can continue to talk about decriminalization and hopefully make some real progress there. I think uh, under Speaker Moody's lead, we, we, we saw progress. And I think if we continue to pass bills out of the House, and amplify this narrative, we're, we're going we're gonna to hopefully get there. I did have some small legislation that dealt with testing and trying to get rid of some of the testing requirements around our public officials, um, not state reps. I'm thinking like our first responders, medical team, fire department, the idea that we don't want to spend as taxpayers all this money to train them and then, uh, and then fire them because they did, they, you know, they use cannabis. It just makes no sense to me. In fact, the idea came to me meeting with Cedar Park Fire Department um, just individuals there, they were talking about, uh, one of them had mentioned they had just been up in Colorado. And so the conversation came up and they said they didn't use because they'd be fired for legally uh, participating in another state. And then coming back to Texas, they could be fired from their job. And so that's just uh, ludicrous to me. So I did have a, a bill. Um, we got a hearing, but that was the extent of it uh, that would have made it where we would stop, you know, drug testing and punishing for marijuana of our public servants. We, we did exclude police at their request because they didn't want to be arresting people and then not be held to the same standard, but it did, but it was inclusive for, you know, fire and ambulance and other EMS, other types of emergency need, just because you think about the investment we do as a, as a government into those individuals and then to go take it away for such a silly reason just makes no sense to me. But I, I'm, I'm excited to be here to talk to all of you because we can, we can make progress in the state. I, I sense it. I feel it. I, I know when we talk to our colleagues across the aisle, especially I think on decriminalization, um, there's some hope on the horizon and I, and I hope we can get it done. Awesome. Thank you. And I do want to reiterate that the work with the first responders and the testing is very important. There have been some EM, EMS um, unions and associations that have been talking to us about how they're getting directives that they're not even supposed to be using, you know, over-the-counter hemp products because of the possibility of perhaps testing because uh, positive because there is trace amounts of THC in there. So um, this is something that is very important because of PTSD and all of these other issues that not only our veterans, but first responders um, are, are faced with. So thank you for being thoughtful about that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for uh, letting me be here to talk to you today. I appreciate it. Awesome, thank you. And next we're going to go to Representative Donna Howard. She represents House District um, 48, I believe it is. And she is an incumbent and a nurse. So I am going to spotlight you, Representative Howard. And if you'll just unmute yourself and take it away. Oh no, is she trapped on mute? There, got it, sorry, um, sorry about that. Uh, and actually I could probably not say anything and just say ditto to everything above and go home because my colleagues have done such an awesome job of laying out all the issues. So I'm, I've got a great group that I, I, rep, um, I work with here in Central Texas and uh, I'm just really thrilled with what I just heard. I think it's all spot on. Um, I've been representing House District 48 since 2006. And as you mentioned, I'm a nurse, a former critical care nurse and a health educator. I'm also a former school board member. I'm a current mom and a grandmom. And I serve on appropriations and higher education committees. And I, I know it's just shocking that uh, an old Austin rep would be advocating for uh, major reforms to our state's cannabis laws. But, but this is something that my constituents have been supporting way before it was cool. <laughs> I've been pushing for a real conversation about adult recreational use for several sessions and have previously actually filed legislation. Also, my district includes one of the only legal dispensaries in the state. 
So on one hand, I'm just here to do my job of representing my constituents. And as you all know, this is something that electeds like those of us here tonight hear about from all kinds of folks. Senior citizens dealing with dementia, veterans trying to find some peace of mind and alternatives to drugs that have serious side effects. Good old fashioned capitalists wondering why Texas is leaving billions of dollars on the table and many others. And I'll just take a personal side note here to say that uh, my husband died two months ago after having a brain injury from, from a cardiac arrest almost a year and a half before. And I can tell you there were many times when I approached the doctors about being able to use cannabis because he at, at times was in severe pain, uh, but I was not able to get that. Uh, the doctors that were working with him in rehab didn't feel like we had enough data yet to, to make that happen. This has got to change. I have personal experience with it now and I'm extremely anxious to see us do better by Texans. As a policymaker, I see a lot of convergence with cannabis regulation between several big issues that we're gonna be dealing with in the 87th, 87th legislative session. Three crises that we're facing have a direct tie to marijuana issue. You've already heard about this criminal justice, public health, and state revenues. I'd actually add a fourth, and that's the disproportionate impact as we were also hearing within criminal justice, but probably in other areas too. We've seen it time and time again. People of color are being disproportionately impacted by all kinds of issues. This is no different. So a lot of our colleagues, as you know, have been leaders on this issue, especially when it comes to public health and criminal justice reforms. And these are fantastic reasons to advance this issue. But I've got to say that as an appropriator, I'm really interested in the economic impact. As you heard, uh, we've been told that a fully developed recreational industry could net the state some 800 million to a billion dollars annually in state revenues. Not to mention the boost to income from entrepreneurs and local economies. As a member of the House Innovation and Technology Caucus, I can tell you this is a fertile field for innovation, not just in agriculture, but in banking, manufacturing, and healthcare. So I'm very grateful for the decades of work that you and Normal have put into advancing this cause. And I'm optimistic that the time is finally right for Texas to seriously reconsider our current cannabis regulations. I've been happy to have your support in the past and I hope you will join me once again. Thanks so much for having me tonight. Thank you for joining us. You know, if I can have just moderator's privilege real quick, I'd like to ask a follow-up question if I may. Okay, sure. You know, you sit on the uh, committee that deals with the processes up at the Capitol. And I know that I was just reading an article about all of the uh, work that you're doing to look at what kind of protocols we might be facing. Do you think you might could give us just a quick update on what it might be like to hold a hearing or to do lobbying during the session? Sure. I mean, unfortunately, the answer is I don't know, but we we have been working on this. Um, I met with the chairman of Chairman Guerin. I'm on the vice the vice chair of House Administration, and, and we worked over the summer earlier to try to get things set up for some interim hearings uh, to put in, put in some safety protocols. But of course, that never happened because the Capitol never opened. And we must have public input. We must have public access. And without that, we can't hold our hearings. So the Capitol is still closed, despite the fact that even today, the governor is loosening the restrictions on bars. We already have other businesses opening up to 75%, but the Capitol is still closed. Uh, so the likelihood of having any kind of hearings in the interim seems pretty unlikely at this point. What's gonna happen in session is, is somewhat up in the air, partially because we don't know what to expect. We're going into flu season. We're going into colder weather, obviously not that cold in Texas, but colder weather where people are indoors more. So there's the potential for another spike. We have to watch it and see what's gonna happen. And we come in in January. So it could be uh, any number of things going on. I can guarantee you though, that whatever we do, we're trying to set it up so that it's safe, transparent, and we have public access. I just don't know what that's gonna look like yet. Well, I definitely take some comfort knowing that you are on the committee that is helping make those decisions and those protocols. And Thanks, I'm yeah. sure that they will be thoughtful and trying to be inclusive so that um, people can have their voices heard because it is so important. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you, Representative Howard. 
And that was the last of our representatives from the House, but now we're going to pivot and go to U.S. Congressionals. Um, so first we have Ted Brown. He is running for the U.S. Uh, Congressional District 17 as a Libertarian. And if you would unmute yourself, Ted, and go ahead and tell us a little bit about your position on cannabis. Yes. Hi, uh, Jax. Thanks for having me. And uh, two major events happened in 1971. First was President Nixon declared the war on drugs, which was a tragedy in and of itself. And the same year, the Libertarian Party was founded. And starting with the first Libertarian Party platform in 1972, this has been the Libertarian Party's issue. We have been opposed to the war on drugs this entire time, especially the war on marijuana. And so in, this, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 00s, in the teens, and now in the 20s, in six different decades, the Libertarians have been steadfast in supporting uh, decriminalization of marijuana and uh, certainly been on the side of uh, Normal's efforts for all this time. Uh, basically, any, anyone else who, any of the other parties have just been playing catch up for the last few years, uh, chasing public opinion, because the public really has come around on this issue. It took a while, unfortunately. Uh, we were like in the wilderness back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s saying, um, you know, ending the war on drugs and um, ending marijuana prohibition. But we were there. I was there personally for the last 40 plus years. I've had an advocacy for this position. Um, and uh, I used to live in California back in 96. I was active in, in the medical the first medical marijuana initiative, which everyone was amazed that passed uh, in California that year. And it was just shocking to so many people, but it was a pioneer. And so many places around the country have gone uh, with medical marijuana and certainly some places have gone with uh, recreational marijuana. And that's the libertarian position that marijuana should be removed from the federal schedule of controlled substances. Uh, it should not be listed as, uh, as something that's uh, controlled. It should be available for any adult to use for any reason they want. It shouldn't matter whether it's uh, medicinal, recreational, et cetera. It's a personal choice. Adults have the right to put any substance in their bodies that they want. Uh, and the government shouldn't be telling them that they can't uh, do that. And uh, all these years of people being put in prison, federal prison for uh, drug offenses, like caging people for a plant is just absolutely disgusting and disgraceful. And as some of the state legislators mentioned, uh, it impacts the uh, African-American community, the black community and the Latino community even more than the white community because uh, uh, minorities, especially young men are so often stopped by police and, and harassed and, and arrested for those kind of offenses. And that was the design of the war on drugs. President Nixon really wanted to go after uh, uh, black people and anti-war protesters. And he thought uh, uh, marijuana was the way to do it. So uh, anyone who's ever been convicted of mar a marijuana offense, a nonviolent uh, drug offense should be uh, pardoned, released from prison, and whether they're still in jail or not, have their records expunged. And uh, liber libertarians would do that. Uh, tens of thousands of federal prisoners would be released right now if uh, this was passed. Obama pardoned some, Trump has pardoned some or, or commuted their sentences. That's just, it's just like a, a drop in the bucket there. 47% of all federal prisoners are in for uh, nonviolent drug offenses and 17% in, in the states. But 47% of federal prisoners, nonviolent drug offenses, absolutely terrible. And that's something that uh, I, as a member of Congress and other libertarians uh, would uh, fight against uh, uh, considerably. One other thing I've added to the mix is that I believe that we should abolish the Office of National Drug Control Policy, which is the drug czar's office. That's just a ridiculous uh, PR uh, office to try to whip up uh, opposition to, uh, or whip up support for the war on drugs. And there's just absolutely no need for that position. That should be uh, abolished completely, totally, and tomorrow afternoon. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Now, let me just mention real quickly in my race, uh, the Republican candidate who's the leading candidate is Pete Sessions, who used to be a Republican congressman from the Dallas area until he was defeated for re-election in 2018. He used to be chairman of the House Rules Committee, and he single-handedly, he's the gatekeeper, he was the gatekeeper in Congress, he single-handedly stopped marijuana reform from coming out of the House and going to the floor of Congress while he was Rules Committee chairman. He's just terrible on that issue. He's one of the worst of the worst uh, of the worst. Uh, besides being an establishment swamp monster, you might say on so many issues. And he, uh, after being defeated in 2018, he went district shopping and found District 17, which includes the north part of Austin, 
uh, Wells Branch, Pflugerville, et cetera, then goes out to Bryan College Station, goes up to um, Waco, and, um, and then uh, about nine rural counties in between. So it's a really big district, very diverse district. Uh, I should say, and I'll, I'll uh, concede, the Democratic candidate, Rick Kennedy, claims to be uh, in favor of some of the same uh, views that I have about uh, the nonviolent uh, or drug offenders and all. I hope that's the case. If he's elected, that, that would be the case, that he would uh, really stick to that position. But it's really tough with the other parties. Even the Democrats are in control of the House right now. And they wanted to uh, uh, have marijuana reform, uh, remove marijuana from the list of controlled substances, like I was advocating. And then they just don't vote on it. They say, oh, no, the uh, stakeholders, you know, like the police and the prosecutors don't want it. So they'll, they'll just follow whatever special interest groups like that uh, want. Uh, I am not beholden to any special interest groups or corrupt party leaders. And that's the case for all libertarians. I'm only concerned about individual rights, personal freedom, economic freedom, uh, upholding the Constitution, uh, and uh, certainly would never uh, support any kind of, uh, of uh, drug laws like that. And as I've said, I want to get rid of as many drug laws as I can. So again, thanks for having me and, and the other libertarians. And I just want to just add, I really applaud the, the four state legislators that came on uh, for their efforts in, at the Texas state capitol. Please keep up the good work uh, at the state level. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ted. It's so nice to have you on and um, reminding us that Pete Sessions is um, trying to get reelected. And you are absolutely right that he is one of the um, longstanding prohibitionists up in D.C. So if you are in district, uh, Congressional District 17, turn out and vote. Um, however you're voting, we, we definitely need to have people out there. All right, so next we're going to hear from Arthur DiBianca um, in Congressional District 21. He's running as a Libertarian. All right, Art, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Jax. Uh, Hi. Thanks for inviting me tonight. Um, yeah, my name's Arthur DiBianca. I'm the Libertarian candidate uh, for Congress in District 21. And um, I was thinking that I feel a little shy talking to you all about this issue because uh, you know so much more about the details than I do. But uh, I think it's safe to say that I'm completely on your side on this issue. Um, it was great to hear from some of the state legislators. And I think that there are some issues that are harder questions for state legislators than they are for federal legislators. I think this is a no brainer issue for members of Congress because uh, federal marijuana laws are harmful they're unjust and they're unconstitutional. And so they fail all of the tests for good legislation. Um, I do think that there are members of Congress who agree with that, but clearly they're not doing much about it. And um, I'm not completely sure why they are behind public opinion on this issue, but uh, I think members of Congress uh, don't make it a very high priority. And we need people in Congress who will make it a high priority and who will file the bills and not just file the bills, but follow up and put pressure on other members to support them. Um, I think there are some federal policies that are challenging to implement because you, know, you have to maybe create an agency or you have to make a lot of adjustments to how things work to fit the new policy. But ending prohibition is easy because all you're doing is you're telling the criminal justice, justice system, here's one less thing you have to worry about. And uh, I suspect we all agree that the less the criminal justice system has to do, uh, the better. So, um, you know, I think I support the complete legalization of marijuana at the federal level. Um, I would certainly uh, file one or more bills to that effect. Uh, I, I'm willing to vote for, I think, what is more likely to pass the Houses of Congress are bills that unfortunately go not so far, and I would probably be willing to support those. Um, you know, for example, I know that, that one of the big problems that, that uh, I believe um, marijuana, marijuana businesses still face, even in states uh, that are doing better than Texas and have legalized, at the state level is financial services problems. And that's certainly something uh, Congress can act on. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that uh, rule number one of good government is do not create black markets. And that is what the federal government has done in this situation. Um, as Ted Brown said, libertarians uh, were on this issue decades before it was cool. And uh, I, I think we've been pretty steadfast on it. And um, I would plan to be myself. So I'm probably not going to take my whole five minutes here, but, uh, but uh, I'm glad to have a chance to talk about it. Well, it's good to see you, Art. It's been a while since I've seen you. So very nice to connect. And also, just so you know, um, we have put together a candidate briefing and there's a whole segment about federal policy. So I'm going to email that to you in case you haven't had a chance to see that yet. And for any of our viewers out there, if you want to make sure that the candidate that you're volunteering for, the person you plan on voting for um, is educated on these things, I, and I would offer that you should share that video as well. You'll find it on our YouTube. So next we have Bill Kelsey. He is running as a libertarian in US Congressional District 25. All right, Bill, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I first heard about the Libertarian Party uh, back in the earlier mid seventies when uh, there was an advertisement on radio said that the libertarians were uh, calling for the legalization of marijuana. And that was the first, uh, I'd heard the word libertarian before I knew it was a polite word for anarchist or so I understood. And um, here they were organized as a party. And uh, even though I'd been known to have a puff or two, I, I thought that was quite out front for them to call for the legalization. So um, libertarians have been on board uh, for a long time. I congratulate the uh, a distinguished uh, Democratic uh, legislators for uh, coming on board onto the libertarian program in this regard. And um, I sure do appreciate it very much. The main uh, disagreement I would have was I kept hearing this word regulate and, and, and that gets libertarians a little worked up when we hear that word regulate and tax. Ooh, um, that also gets us nervous. So I, I, I don't, they had some wonderful things to say. The only case where I disagree with them was when they talk about regulating and taxing and it shouldn't be any more regulated or taxed than my fig tree or, or, or a tomato plant in my backyard. So um, that's, that's where um, I, I would disagree. Other than that, when it gets to the actual bills, to me, it seems like a simple thing, but um, the um, attorneys have a way of making them complicated. So I would just turn to uh, Jackson, tell me how to vote, or if I had to initiate, it came to me to initiate a bill of some sort, I would have uh, Jax or somebody she advised write it for me and, and make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. And that's what I would do. I don't, I don't need to preach to the choir here. What I'd really like to get a word in about is our wars overseas. While you're enjoying your puff, do not forget the uh, many wars that our country is engaged in, often in countries that um, the American public doesn't even know exist. And um, these wars are launched by both Democrats and Republicans. They're bipartisan efforts. The uh, massive presence of the US military abroad is something that's supported by both parties with some wonderful shining lights that are exceptions. Libertarians, we are the anti-war pro-peace party and I urge all my friends to uh, vote libertarian if you're against the wars abroad and we will not compromise on that issue. And that's all I need to say, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, side note about Bill, Bill takes care of pigeons, but they're white pigeons, so we call them doves. And it's a nice little hobby that I've seen him uh, release them a couple times. <laughs> um, next, our last candidate before we get to the q and I do see some questions in the box below and in the comments um, on our Facebook stream. So we'll get to those in just a minute. Keep dropping them in there. Um, but next we have Clark Patterson. He is running for U.S. Congressional District 31 as a libertarian. Clark, tell us a little bit about your positions. Well, first, let me just say thank you, Jax. Thanks you so much for having us third party candidates. 
in your forum, I couldn't help but notice that none of the major party candidates uh, were attending tonight. Uh, were they invited, Jax, if you don't mind me asking? So we invited all of the Republicans, Democrats, and Libertarians. Some had pre-existing, um, you know, uh, events that they were participating in, but we had a total of nine today, and there were um, four Democratic incumbents that also participated. Oh, okay. Well, I, I noticed the congressional candidates, though. Tonight, there are uh, actually none other than uh, we Libertarians, which, of course, I'm not complaining about, but I think it's kind of a sad commentary sometimes when somehow the major party candidates cannot be bothered enough to actually participate in some very important forums. Uh, we've noticed that all of us libertarian candidates have noticed that uh, throughout other forums as well. Somehow uh, often we're excluded uh, as third party candidates and uh, other times when the, the major party candidates are part of the forum, somehow we third party candidates uh, are, are unable to somehow they they can't make room room for us at that point so uh, but again let me just say uh, using part of my five minutes to, to thank you again Jax uh, for including everybody all the candidates that are on the ballot which of course includes uh, libertarians and in some some races uh, the, the green party as well and in other races of course they're independents and uh, but let me just say I I completely agree with almost everything that's been said up to this point uh, by, in this case, not only other libertarian candidates, but even the Democratic uh, inc incumbents who spoke at the outset. Uh, I pretty much agree with everything they said, except, of course, for the taxation part. Uh, as libertarians, we really are, are, are not crazy about any kind of taxes. And so we would, uh, we would decriminalize and legalize uh, all controlled substances, uh, but we would not uh, ever use the argument that somehow uh, the state of Texas is going to raise more money by taxing uh, individual citizens. So uh, I disagree with that. And I also would just like to point out that uh, many libertarians, such as myself, I consider myself a Second Amendment absolutist. And uh, we find, though, often that in the general public, often um, people try to portray gun owners as highly irresponsible, you know, just maybe a few steps away of becoming a mass shooter. And of course, that's exactly what, when I was growing up in school, we were all forced to watch Reefer Madness. And so the impression that the, the, the drug prohibitionists were trying to, to impart was that, hey, look, you're gonna end up you know, an addict and marijuana is a gateway drug. And uh, you know, of course, that's all bogus. And the vast, vast majority you know, 99% of, of people who use drugs do so responsibly. And as a libertarian, I would just mention that I think that's also the case with the Second Amendment. The vast, vast majority of gun owners use their guns responsibly uh, and they're highly effective deterrents to crime. Often, as we've noticed, uh, even throughout the summer with all the protests, the, the police do not do a very good job of protecting rights. They seem to do a better job at violating rights. So, so I would just leave uh, leave the listeners with the, the note that you know the vast majority of gun owners. By the way, I'm not I'm not a gun owner. I must, I'm probably one of the last few males in Texas that doesn't own a gun, and I'm actually not a, a regular marijuana user. Uh, I just I'm I'm just not. But I know the vast majority of, of marijuana users. Uh, and drug users use those drugs responsibly, and they should be allowed to. And it's the same thing for, for the war on, on guns. The vast majority of gun owners that, that I know of, and, and evidence supports this, the vast majority of gun, gun owners use those weapons responsibly. And the only other thing I could add, if I have a few moments here, is, you know, we, I, I kind of digress from this kind of current trend that we have over the last quarter century or so of, of labeling everything that's bad racist. And uh, I would just emerge from that. I mean, we know of course that all, all racist laws are anti-liberty, but not all anti-liberty laws are racist. And I would include the war on drugs in, in that category. And I would just, I would also note that, you know, even if every person who was arrested for drug use was white, I'd still be against the drug laws. 
And I think that's the case with pretty much everybody tonight. So I think the evidence is, is, is not conclusive yet that, uh, you know, the, the drug laws did not, weren't, they didn't come about because uh, some white politicians back in the 60s and 70s decided, hey, we know that minorities seem to like to use marijuana and other drug, cocaine or heroin. So let's pass a series of drug laws. I don't think that's kind of how government works. I think most statists, most people, uh, you know, who believe in a lot of government involvement and, you know, believes the government should have a heavy hand in regulating people's lives do that irrespective of race. And so, again, I would just say, again, all, all racist laws are anti-liberty, but not all anti-liberty laws and legislation is racist. And I think that's, uh, I would say that's the case with the, with the war on drugs from what the evidence I've seen thus far. But again, thank you so much, Jax, for for having uh, having all of us here, and uh, again, since I had to agree, I agree with everyone up to this point, I had to just bring up a couple of things that maybe there's some disagreement on. I may have the mi minority position on the on that last uh, comment, but uh, anyway, thank you again so much for for having us. Uh, we we really do appreciate it. Thank you, Clark. I appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. And um, just to touch on what you were saying about including um, the third parties, um, I know that. It just so happens that there's also a debate going on right now, um, but there is not one of the uh, uh, candidates on the stage. So you've got Kamala Harris and you've got Mike Pence, but then there's also Spike Cohen, who is on the ballot in all 50 states with Joe Jorgensen. So I just thought I would bring up that little detail um, as we now pivot to a little lightning round Q&A. Um, we lost a couple people along the way because they had some other events and some things going on, but we do have a few questions and, um, you know, if you guys have some thoughts about them, please feel free to unmute and share. So the first question is actually having to do about growing cannabis. So we talk a lot about, um, you know, people growing it to sell it in the store. But this question is about home grow, people who are growing cannabis on their own property for their own consumption. Um, can you guys tell us your position on home grow in Texas? I'll do it. Yeah, like do I said, my, oh, <laughs> my, my fig tree, right? my fig tree, I didn't ask anybody permission to plant a big fig tree or, or, uh, or a tomato plant, so yes. Grow, grow, and and if you share it with your neighbor, I'm sure your neighbor will appreciate it. Dr. That's right. Anyone, anyone should be able to grow marijuana in their yards or in their house or wherever they want uh, for their own use, their friends' use, whatever the case may be. And there should be absolutely no uh, government involvement in that whatsoever. Did you guys have anything to add, Art or Clark? I agree. <laughs> all right, Get so on. we're all on the same page. <laughs> yes. So there's another question about expungement. You know, here in Texas, uh, we found out recently um, it, it was almost 93,000 people that were at arrest, 93,000 people that were arrested for possession one year, and that's like really striking, right? It, and and it was a recent year, it was 2018. And on average, you know, we arrest 60 to 80,000 Texans, and then they have these license, uh, these um, records for their life that they have to go through. Um, so there's conversation about expungement. And so expungement is where you can get rid of that old record and you no longer have to like check the box on your application. Um, ex expungement in Texas can kind of be a difficult process. Can you tell um, our viewers, do you support expungement? And if so, what would you do to make it easier? Yes. Well Yes, and, and at the, I was, I've been running at the federal level, so as I mentioned before, uh, certainly there, there are 47% of all federal prisoners are in there for nonviolent drug offenses, and there's countless thousands others who have been let out and still have the felony convictions, like you said, where it may, they have to check uh, that they had a felony conviction, and certainly in Texas, uh, it's the same way, but this is like a really tough law and order state, so it's, uh, it'd be kind of hard to get uh, people expunged for anything. You know, uh, but hopefully that would be the case. I mean, uh, you practically would have to elect a libertarian legislature and governor to just start uh, go, putting willy nilly pardons uh, into the uh, uh, system, because I don't see that happening with uh, either of the, uh, the two establishment uh, major parties. They're, they're so worried about being considered soft on crime, even though this isn't crime. 
This isn't a crime as murder, rape, robbery, defrauding people. This is not crime. But uh, the police uh, and, the, and the politicians love marijuana and other drugs to be illegal because it just gives them more power over people. And uh, they want power. And so yeah. I think that expungement, expungement is not going to happen in Texas as far as I can see. But I do think it's great to bring that up as a, as a point. I mean, that's, that's yeah. an issue. Usually when we think about uh, ending prohibition, I, we don't always go that far in what we think about. So it's great to bring that up. Um, yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate the question. And then something that is definitely has to do with the federal level. I think all of, uh, yeah, all of you guys are running at the federal level. Um, talking about the gun right issue that actually Clark brought up. Um, there is a big problem with the fact that some registered medical cannabis patients um, cannot, you know, get licenses for guns because of the 11E portion of the application. And um, it also creates an issue here in Texas where uh, if you are driving with a gun and some cannabis, oh boy, oh boy, you went from being in a little bit of trouble to being in a lot of bit of trouble. Um, so can you guys maybe talk to me about some ideas that you might have to help um, improve that for people who do want to um, practice their right of bearing arms? Well, guns, guns and cannabis have nothing to do with each other as far as I'm concerned. There's no cannabis exception to the Second Amendment. People have the right to keep and bear arms as far as I'm concerned, and there's no uh, you know, cannabis exception. If anything, someone would be too mellow to be using the gun if they're, if they're using, <laughs> having both the, the cannabis and the, uh, and the gun at the same time. Come on, it's, it's, absolutely, it's just another excuse to, put, to arrest more people, uh, roust more people during traffic stops, and uh, just violate people's rights. I mean, uh, those two things should have nothing to do with each other. Uh, this just, I said at the beginning that I was a little shy about talking about this issue, and this shows why we need your organization giving information mm -hmm. to politicians and legislators, because some of the details you just described are details I did not know before. And so I'm glad to have more information. And kind of terrifying. I, I know some veterans in Texas who, you know, happen to have a qualifying condition, but they aren't going to get their card because they're concerned about, you know, their right um, to, to carry their arms. I mean, is that something, is that specific issue something that can be addressed at the federal level or does that require a state level? My understanding, a very cursory understanding, I'd have to speak to some specialists, you know, to delve in deeply, but is that th that document that you have to fill out and the registration is a, is a federal thing. And so therefore it would be something that you um, folks would deal with. All right, so uh, Lauren has a question here for us. And she says, how do you feel about donations of cannabis to the medically needy or elderly that are in lower income brackets? Oh, I'm, I'm sure that, that growers are the most generous people. We'll, we'll, we'll donate. And certainly they should be allowed to. There should be no hesitation there. If, if uh, they want to give, give it away to whoever they want to give it to is fine. And uh, again, there, uh, there, there are medical benefits to marijuana. It's been well known for a long time, but you just don't have any official uh, knowledge of that because the federal, federal government won't allow uh, research. And then in the state level, a lot of the, uh, even in California or Colorado or Washington, the states where it's pretty much completely legal, uh, the, uh, even the educational institutions there are worried about the federal government. So there's just not a lot of research uh, and there should be. It's astonishing to me to think that any member of Congress would believe that the Constitution gives Congress the power to stop that from happening. A gift of a plant. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there are a lot of um, very uh, heinous, for lack of a better word, uh, collateral consequences that can, you know, come with uh, possession. Lauren has a follow-up question. Um, you know, parents of children, the children who, who benefit from cannabis, those parents are often shamed and sometimes persecuted by maybe people in their, in their group. And so, and definitely CPS. Um, so what do you think um, you could do to help protect those um, patients and their children? I know at the federal level, it might be a little bit difficult um, to come up with something specific because it is kind of a state run organization, but uh, broadly philosophically, you know, kind of thinking what would, what is a good protection for parents that decide that their children could benefit from cannabis? 
Well, they certainly should be able to do that. I, I've read of many cases where the kids have uh, some kind of seizures and uh, nothing helps on the regular medication, just like loaded up with all kinds of pharmaceuticals, doesn't help them. And then they just start using CBD oil or some other kind of marijuana product and uh, the seizures start going away. I mean, it's just like child abuse to not let kids use that. But uh, um, again, with, with parental permission, certainly kids should be able to uh, uh, benefit from those products the same as, uh, as adults do. And, for, and, and if, if it becomes legal to do that, then obviously uh, Child and Protective Services would not have any cause to go after those parents. You have to like legalize, and, uh, legalize the, these items. And that way they're not illegal and they're not considered like, oh, these parents are criminals or, or whatever. So it, it really just goes back to ending the uh, drug laws. And education too, ending sure. the prejudice um, that some people still have for the plant. I think that that's really important, especially, you know, sometimes, and I don't like to, you know, kind of generalize, but it can tend to be sometimes more rural areas as opposed to urban areas. And, you know, there's a lot of education to be done. And um, typically, you know, right around this time, Heather and I are doing a tour of Texas where we're doing training workshops and stuff like that. But we're not doing that this time. Uh, we did an online version. Um, but it's definitely a lot of work leading up to the session. So th there's one last question I want to get to before. Can I just add one thing to that yes. last one? Yes. I think that unfortunately, um, there's a sort of a big sector of the population that believes that things are bad because they're illegal. And so <laughs> if something's not illegal anymore, there are a lot of people who just won't think of it as being as bad as they used to think. Mm. So that's another benefit, not just in terms of the criminal justice system, but in terms of popular attitude, I think. It's a, I hear that from yeah. a lot of seniors, actually, is that, you know, I really wanted to try it, but I didn't before because it was illegal. But now, you know, I, I have cancer, I'll sign up for the program, or I have MS, I'll sign up for the program. Um, so, and, you know, this kind of segues into the last question, uh, which is, you know, how do we expand the medical program? And, um, and what expansion do we want to see? So we recently did the workshop where we walked through the whole legislative and electoral process. And I'll post that link in the follow-up blog where we'll have this video and some other helpful links. But basically what we need to have in Texas is where doctors are deciding with their patients what kind of cannabis would benefit the conditions that they have. And we need to make sure that the cap on THC is removed and that the arbitrary list of conditions, it can be inclusive because right now we have about 12 conditions on a list for people that can get 0.5 percent thc cannabis oil we are seeing some um you know new uptake methods coming on the market from some of these people uh but it's definitely very important that we let doctors and patients really decide what their best therapeutic uh, benefits would be and and let them handle that as opposed to the government regulations. So just to touch on that briefly, um, how much money from taxes levied on cannabis could be spent? Did I read that right? How should money from taxes levied on cannabis be spent? Oh, I'm sorry. I lied. There's one more question and it's about taxes. So there's <laughs> a lot of discussion about how um, those funds should be spent. Um, there are people or there are states that put it towards public schooling. There are states that put it towards public health initiatives. Um, so there's all kinds of ways it can be directed. It could be directed, you know, to the rainy day fund or, you know, there's all kinds of ways that, that, that those taxes can be spent. But when we're talking about taxes, I think it's extremely important that we realize that if you're going to tax this plant, that you have to make sure that you are keeping the taxes as absolutely low as possible or the black market just continues to thrive because people will continue to purchase things uh, more affordable, even though there may be less you know, protections for them. Yeah, feel, um, and go ahead, Art. I was just gonna say that I feel the same way when people bring up, when I hear the word regulation and people say, well, it's okay, we can just regulate it. Regulation can become also like a backdoor prohibition and can also, like you said, the bias markets persist. So I Absolutely. think that's an important, important to watch both regulation and taxation because 
like I said earlier, you don't want to create wide markets. And really, well, regulation should be, you know, making sure that consumers are protected. Um, just, you know, like if, if the product is bad, can you have recourse, you know, for uh, uh, for the company? Legislators will find a way to start there and end up with a kind of backdoor prohibition. Though. That's my theory. Well, let me tell you the one interesting thing about the process is that the legislators are only really half of this equation. The legislators write the statute, but then it goes through the regulatory making process that different bureaucrats agencies create these rules and that's all the meat and bones on the skeleton uh, or I'm sorry uh, meat and skin on the skeleton that was it's Halloween so that's why I use that <laughs> that um, example but so it advocacy does not end at the capital you have to continue it into regulatory advocacy and so that's why we've done a lot of work you know up at the TDA hearings and up at the Department of State Health Services hearings so that's extremely important stuff um, Isn't there a, I, I have one point too to add or ask um, about this. Doesn't the regulatory slash tax process also imply that certain people are given licenses to grow and they can be the mega growers and in, in exchange for them having a monopoly on growing and having a big market and other people without a license being excluded then those mega growers can pay a tax. Or, I mean, that's how it works. Is is that my understanding? Well, so there's taxes and then there's licensing fees. So taxes, um, depending on the structure, can be paid at every step of the process or just paid by at the end by the consumer. Um, but then you have um, these license fees, right? So. Uh, large grower might have a X dollar license fee, but a home grower might have a much more affordable license fee. So there's actually two avenues of revenue um, that the government usually gets from these type of initiatives. So little little tax lesson. I'm not a tax specialist, but I know that. <laughs> well, you know, you'd have to know that libertarians, whether they're in the state legislature, uh, if we get in there and if we go to Congress, we're not gonna be uh, uh, advocating taxes. We don't raise taxes on anybody. We might not get an opportunity to cut taxes, but we sure are gonna create some new tax. I mean, that's like a given for libertarians. There you go. Awesome, well, thank you guys. I'm going to pivot now to important dates and upcoming events, but I wanna thank each of you for participating and staying around for our Q&A. I really enjoyed chatting with all of you. And for everybody who is watching, um, there's also our voter guide available at texasnormal.org. You can click there and you can look up how your representative or how your legislator or your candidates in your area stand on these positions. So thank you so much, gentlemen. And- um, I'll be tuning in on November 3rd to see how everything goes. <laughs> All right. So okay, now thanks. talking about some upcoming events and some important voting information. Um, I am going to share that link for the workshop, like I mentioned. And in the workshop, I go over some um, mail-in ballot details and some other information. But just a few high level things for you to know. If you are not already registered to vote, I am so sorry, it is too late. The deadline to register to vote was October 5th. Now, early voting for the general election is going to begin on the 13th and it's gonna run all the way to the 30th. You may have seen that there was a lawsuit going on to shorten that time frame, um, but it did not, uh, it, at this point in time has not been successful. So we do anticipate that it'll be from the 13th to the 30th that you'll be able to participate in early voting. And then general election day is going to be on November the 3rd, if you choose to vote the day of the election. Now, I would encourage you to vote early, especially with how some of these situations are right now, to learn more about um, mail-in voting. We'll share that link with, you, link with you as well. And then another thing to note is just six days after these legislators are elected, they start authoring bills. So on November the 9th, that is when pre-filing begins. If your bill is pre-filed, um, you have a much higher chance of it making it through the process. I think it's something like 20% more or something like that. Um, but a few dates not um, election related and not legislative related are this month of October is typically whenever we host this big members mixer, it's a private members only event, but clearly 
you know, we're not having a big party right now. Um, so what we're doing instead is we're doing a membership drive for the month of October. And for only the month of October, we have a specialty uh, steel tumbler that is available that you will get with your membership. So please go and sign up at texasnormal.org. There's also a couple of interesting seminars that are coming up uh, that the Foundation for an Informed Texas are, is hosting. One of them is gonna be Best Practices for Temp in Texas, and that's gonna be on November 5th at noon. And then there also is going to be a conference coming up with Texans for Responsible Marijuana Policy. Their conference is going to be the 20th and 21st of November. And then, on January 12th, that is not only the first day of the legislative session, but we'll also be holding a legislative workshop. As you heard from Representative Howard, it's a little bit up in the air how everything's gonna go with hearings and with lobbying up at the Capitol. Um, so we will have the most up-to-date information for you available then. I also wanted to point out um, that there were some candidates that wanted to participate tonight, but could not because of other, uh, you know, extenuating circumstances. So again, I encourage you to go to texasnormal.org, click on our voter guide tab, and find out how your um, candidates in your area stand on this very important topic. And so I know that there is a debate going on. It's kind of interesting that our monthly meeting <laughs> ended up being on the same night as the presidential debate. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this video, put it on YouTube, and we're going to share it with everybody in the districts that had candidates here today so that they can hear from these candidates and learn a little bit more about their position. And guys, that's it for tonight. I'm gonna to keep it short and sweet. I appreciate all of you for tuning in and being involved. It's a very exciting and wild time right now. And so we're all just learning and doing our best together. And I just wanna thank everyone for your continued support of Texas Normal and our work to legalize marijuana in Texas. So I hope that you guys have a wonderful night.